So we're, we're, um, we're in our series on uh, biblical worldview, and this week I wanted to talk about how to overcome sin, uh, what, the, what the Bible says about this. Um, with, with most people, and uh, actually in most philosophies, uh, the way that you overcome sin, and they don't call it sin, but the way that you overcome problems is you have a 12-step, you know, process. You know, sometimes they'll talk about that kind of thing. Uh, you work really hard. You discipline yourself. You, you know, there's all these things that people go through uh, to try to change their life. And uh, there's evidence all around us that they are um, the, the things that people try, whether you're talking about philosophy or even religion, those things are not effective. And the Bible is really clear on how sin gets taken care of. And this is one of those chapters, we're going to be in Romans chapter 6, I, I can't remember if I told you that, um, but this is one of those chapters that kind of goes through and gels, gels down um, how this whole thing works as far as turning away from sin and living a righteous life. Um, you can't divorce Romans chapter 6 from its context. It's got, got a context in the whole book, and so we're going to talk about that too. Um, but there's some really cool things in here, you guys. And it's one of those things that obviously as Christians, we want to live righteously. We want to have a life that's pleasing to the Lord. We want to, you know, we want to not be enslaved to our junk anymore. And uh, Paul goes through and he talks about specifically how to do that. And so it's going to be a good time as we're going through this. Let's all stand and let's go through and read it. Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves, whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you uh, presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For, this, uh, for the end of those things is death. But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray. And got cool chapter, lots of good things in there. And uh, Lord, as we're going through it, we just pray that you would be speaking to our hearts and just showing us, Lord, in, in just real practical ways, what it means to turn away from sin, what it means to follow you, and what it means to give our hearts over to you, not only our hearts, but our bodies, Lord. And we ask that you just bless the time. Lord, we want to pray for anybody who's here this morning that doesn't know you, and uh, just ask that you'd be working in their hearts also. Show them how good you are, Lord. And we ask that you do this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you can have a seat. Um, as you go through the book of Romans, um, in Romans 1 through 5, we're taught that we're dead in sin. Dead in sin. 
Um, sin has brought the sentence of death to all humanity. In Romans 6, we're taught that we're dead to sin and that sin no longer has any authority over my life. In, in Romans chapter 1 through 5, I'm free from the penalty of sin. In Romans chapter 6 through 8, I'm free from the power of sin. Um, in 1 through 5, we find that righteous, the righteousness of Jesus has been credited to my account. Uh, the Bible teaches that you're a sinner and you have no ability to live up to the standards that God has set for righteousness. We're all destined for hell. Every single one of us is destined for hell without Jesus. God looks down and because of his love and compassion, he makes a way. And that way involves the ultimate sacrifice that God uh, could give for you or for me. And that ultimate sacrifice is obviously his son. When I receive that gift, the gift of Jesus um, in my life, I uh, have open access to the Lord and his power anytime I want it. And not only that, but Jesus intercedes for me uh, uh, and for you on our behalf to God. You have the Son of God praying for you. And so that's all cool stuff. Let me, I'm going to gel this down as far as Romans chapter 1 through 5. In Romans chapter 1, it talks about unbelievers. And it talks about the fact that what they, the reason that they're in the stuff that they're in is because they have turned away from the truth, from what they know to be true about God. They've turned away from God as creator. They've turned away from God as judge. And they've decided to go their own direction. And God let them. And he gives them over. And so first he gives them over to sexual immorality. Then he gives them over to homosexuality. Then he gives them over to whatever filthy garbage that they want to get into. God gives people over, and the fact that people get caught up in these, in these areas in their life is because God has taken a step back because they've rejected him. That's what happens. Romans chapter 2. And so Paul looks at the whole Gentile world, and he goes, this is what's happening with these guys. What they knew about God, they refused to listen to. In fact, they suppressed it and decided that they didn't want to hear it anymore, and they went in, in exactly the opposite way. When you get to Romans chapter 2, Paul talks about religious people, because not only were there, you know, just profligate, all kinds of, you know, people in the pagan world that were just really messed up, but there were people who were into philosophy, there were people who were, who were into religion, Stoics, you know, you have all kinds of philosophers. Um, in Greek thought during that period of time. And they, many of the philosophies were all about being um, disciplined and making sure that your life looked a certain way. And what Paul says in Romans chapter 2, that, this, that all, of those, all of those things that people got into, that, that they were into at that time, were ineffective because when they judged other people, what they weren't recognizing is that they were just like them. And not only does he talk about the Gentile philosophies or the Gentile religions, he's talking about the Jewish religion too. And at the end of chapter 2, he just really caps on the Jews and he talks about so God doesn't want outward circumcision. He wants circumcision of the heart. He wants something that's real on the inside. And then in chapter 3, he goes through and he says, the whole world is absolutely guilty before God. And what God did was he brought in the Ten Commandments to seal the deal on how guilty we were. In fact, the commandments were given not to make us righteous, but to shut us up. That's what the Ten Commandments are for. Not, not just the Ten. You guys know there's 613. Most of us don't know what those are. 613 commandments made to shut you up and to show you that you're guilty before God so that salvation would not come from man's righteousness but so that we would understand that salvation can only come from God. There's no way out of this. We are all messed up units. And so chapter three is the whole world is guilty before God. There are no options other than God entering in and doing something for us. And then in chapter four, he starts talking about grace. Actually, at the end of chapter three, beginning of chapter four, he begins talking about grace. Grace is, what's it mean? Unmerited, Unmerited favor, getting good things that I don't deserve. And when you're talking about salvation, salvation is a good thing that you do not deserve. And if you think you deserve it, you are caught up in chapter 2. If you think that you deserve it, you can read later on in chapter 7. You are caught up in chapter 7 if you think you deserve it, the, sal the salvation that you've gotten. We, we have grace that's given to us because there were no other options. And when you, when you get to chapter 4, 
Paul goes through and he talks about David and he talks about Abraham and he talks about the fact that these guys are examples of the grace of God poured out on mankind and how um, God just did a work in their life and turned them towards him. Chapter 5 um, basically talks about freedom from sin and justification, the fact that God makes it just like you never sinned. When we get saved, what happens is the, my, my sin has been paid for by the death of Jesus, and so it goes. my sin goes to his account and his righteousness. Jesus is the only one that kept the law perfectly. His righteousness is credited to my account. So I get what Jesus deserves, and Jesus got what I deserve. And that's the only way in. It's the only way into heaven. That's why Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me. If you look down at, uh, in chapter 5, at um, verse 18, um, at the end of chapter 5, he talks about where the whole sin problem came from, and it came from Adam. And um, in verse 18, it says, Therefore, as through one man's offense, that's Adam, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more, so that sin, as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so, again, what Jesus does is he comes in and he pays for my sin. This is, this is the, the, the deal with everybody on this planet um, that are not believers. They have access to heaven if they want it. Look at verse 19 again. For as by one man's disobedience, who's that man? That's Adam. And so the Bible says that the, the sin problem started with Adam and it got passed down to every single one of us. I don't become a sinner when I sin. I sin to prove that I'm a sinner. My sin is just the result of my nature and my nature I got from my mom and from my dad and from their mom and dad and all the way back to Adam. That's where it came from. And so my unrighteousness, its ultimate cause is Adam's. It doesn't leave me free from the penalty of that because I get into that willingly. I want to sin. You know, talking about the first couple of chapters. But as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. And look at again, again in verse 18. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. So Adam's sin affected us all. Jesus' righteousness has the potential to affect us all. It does affect us all, but it has the potential in the, in the sense that God gives people a free will to accept the righteousness that, God, that God's given to you or not. And so everybody on this planet should be going to heaven. Everybody on this planet should be going to heaven. And the only reason that they don't is because they turn away from the light and they don't want to. It's already been paid for. And that's the point of that passage. And so when he gets into to chapter 6, actually I, I was talking earlier about chapter 6, 7, and 8 are all about how I'm, free from, I'm set free from the power of sin. So in 1 through 5, I'm free from the penalty of sin. God's taken away the penalty of sin because of what Jesus has done for me. In 6, 7, and 8, I'm freed from the power of sin. There's a difference between being freed uh, from the penalty of, of sin in the sense that I've been justified. And like I said before, the word justification means to be made just as if I'd never sinned. So when I become a Christian, my penalty for sin goes on Jesus. His righteousness comes on me. It's why I'm going to heaven. And what God does is he puts in my account basically something that I have not earned. And he says, you are worthy of heaven. Not because of what you've done, but because of what my son has done. He looks at his son, he goes, you are worthy of judgment. Not because of what you've done, but because of what Steve's done. And it's, exa it's a swap is what's happening there. But then there's practical life. So I'm free from the penalty of sin. I've been made just as if I'd never sinned as far as God's concerned, but I still have a sin problem because I'm me. 
I'm sitting here with flesh, and I'm sitting here with an attitude, and I'm sitting here with a mindset, I'm sitting here with all this, all this stuff that I got raised with and all these reactions that I, I make to the, the things that happen around me, and here, we, here I am, Steve Winery, in all my glory, and how am I going to ever stop doing the things that, I'm, that I've been doing? And so there's the, there's the um, justification that's given to you as far as uh, uh, your... your um, righteousness has been appointed to you. There's an appointed justification. But then there's a real righteousness that comes from a real walk with God where you turn away from sin and you begin having some victory in your life. And I don't know about you, but I like to win. I hate losing. And, you know, I've grown up some. I don't, I don't, uh, you know, I don't get all ticked off if I, if I lose something. But you ever play games on your computer, right? I have chess on my computer. I hate losing at chess. I hate it. I hate it when the computer beats me, ticks me off. I don't like it. You know, it's like, as soon as I, as soon as I'm losing, I just want to quit the game. As soon as I realize I can't, I'm never going to win against this thing. I just want to lower the levels so that I win every single time. That's, that's kind of how I'm made up. That's not what I would do with you if we were playing, but I'd want to really bad. Just want to walk away from the game. And I don't like to lose. And I don't like to lose as a Christian either. And I'm, I'm sure that you don't like to lose either. Paul starts off with this, this whole thing in chapter 6. And he's referring back to verse 20 of chapter 5. It says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. And like I was saying, the law entered to show how sinful we actually are and to shut our mouths. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. And so I need to shut my mouth but then on the, on the other hand, God comes in and in his overwhelming grace, he makes me received, accepted, the Bible says, in the beloved. The beloved being Jesus. I'm accepted in Jesus. So grace abounds. And then Paul starts on chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue uh, in sin that grace may abound? And in verse 2, he says, certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it. So shall we continue in sin? And obviously the answer is no. You know, there are some people who think that they have a license to sin. They think they get, get saved and because their salvation is something that's free and it's been the grace of God, they like to talk about the grace of God a whole lot. And um, some of the people that I've, that I've talked with over the years, the reason that they talk about the grace of God so much is because they don't plan on stopping. They're just going to continue. And every time that they do it, they look to the grace of God as some kind of excuse uh, to not turn their lives around. Some people have they think that they have a license to sin. The old 60s James, James Bond movies, um, James Bond was identified as James Bond, 007, license to kill. That's what, that's what they called him. And there are some Christians who think that they have a license to sin. And um, one of the things that we need to remember about sin in our lives is that there are repercussions to sin. Um, you know the story of David uh, in the Old Testament. So in chapter 4, uh, Paul, in talking about David, talks about the righteousness that was given to David and specifically um, quotes from David out of Psalm 32. You know what Psalm 32 was about? It was about a year-long situation where David was out of fellowship with God because he'd sinned with Bathsheba. And it was about his repentance and how God's refreshing came into him um, after the point where he turned his heart around. And so he talks about the grace of God that's mentioned in Psalm 32, but it's in the context of David's sin with Bathsheba. You know that story. So David looks at Bathsheba and, uh, from across the way, and he lusts after her. He uh, gets into an adulterous relationship with her. She gets pregnant. He tries to, he calls the husband back from where, warfare where he'd sent him, calls him back and tries to get him to sleep with his wife so he can cover up his sin. And the guy has so much integrity, he refuses to sleep with his wife because the, his men in the field aren't able to do the same thing. So David gets him drunk. That doesn't work either. And so finally what David does is he writes out a command to his general to have this guy go up close to the wall of the city that they're besieging and then have everybody abandon him there and have him killed. He allows the enemy to kill uh, Uriah the Hittite. He, and Uriah takes his death warrant in his hand, never opens it. 
He has no idea what he's carrying to Joab. And he hands it to Joab. Joab opens it up, reads it, and does exactly what David says. And a year later, there is a situation where Nathan the prophet comes walking in. David, um, by this time, is married. Bathsheba thinks he's got it covered up. Um, uh, there is a baby that's born. And when, uh, after about a year, Nathan the prophet comes walking in and tells him a story about a guy who barbecued his next door neighbor's little lamb, um, who was a pet. And David was so furious that he said, that guy's gonna, that guy's gonna die and he's gonna pay back sevenfold. So first I'm gonna kill him and then he's paying back sevenfold. That's how mad he was. And then Nathan points his bony finger at David and says, you're the man. And it's at that point, and Nathan has some choice things to say to him. And at that point, what, all that David says is, I have sinned. And you can't tell from the, obviously it's, it's the written word, and you can't tell uh, what kind of emotion was used there, but it was to the point where everybody in the room knew that David was repentant at this point. And so David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord has also put away your sin. You shall not die. However, because by this deed you've given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme the child also who is born to you shall surely die. And that's exactly what happened. There are repercussions to my sin. The fact, the fact that Jesus forgives me for my sin doesn't mean that I don't have consequences to those things. And the consequences can be different depending on what the sin is, obviously. In this case, it was adultery. And adultery can lead to pregnancy. And pregnancy leads to babies. And um, obviously, when I repent of the sin of adultery, it doesn't mean that babies aren't going away. If I repent of the sin of adultery, it doesn't mean that my family is necessarily going to be restored. There's all kinds of repercussions to these things. And obviously, we know that. We need to be aware of that. We need to understand it. Um, we are not to continue in sin. Galatians 6, 7 says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. And in the passage, it talks about sowing to the flesh. You're going to reap corruption. But if you sow to the Spirit, you're going to reap righteousness. Holy living does not produce righteousness, but righteousness does produce holy living. And that's the key to this whole thing. You know, I am, I'm not called to go out and try to change my own life. I can't do that. And that's what chapters one through five is all about. I can't change my own life. But once Christ has come into my life and I've actually received the things that Jesus has for me, what, what happens is I am, I am granted positional righteousness, and because of repentance, my heart is turned towards righteousness, and that kind of righteousness that the Bible talks about will produce holy living. So this is what I'm telling you. You can go out and try to live holy all you want to. You can try to, you, you can try to put on an outward uh, show of what it is to be a Christian, and it is never going to change your heart inwardly. It has to go in exactly the opposite direction. So, when I'm having a problem with my mouth, my big fat mouth, I ask Jesus to change my hardened heart. Jesus said, out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. And so the problem is not the outside, the problem is right here, it's right here. And so I have to go to the Lord and say, Jesus, you gotta change my heart. I need to love these people, I need to, you know, if, I, if there's filth coming out of my mouth, Jesus, I have a filthy heart, will, will you please purify me? Had a friend of, uh, actually my son, was talking about a friend of his, and um, the, the kid was, uh, there, you know, there's, there's this amazing thing that's um, taken place over the last 30 years or so. When I was in high school, there was nobody who was gay. I didn't know anyone. And I was, I was, in, a, I was in a messed up place. I knew no one who was gay. And all of a sudden, because it's all, you know, it's, it's all over the media, Half the, half the kids in high school think that they're gay. My son ran into a buddy of his that is in the same kind of situation where he's thinking along those terms, and he's a Christian. 
He says, I'm attracted to men, I'm a Christian, and so what I'm going to do is I'm just not going to, I, I recognize that I've got this whole thing going on, I'm probably gay, and what I'm going to do is I'm just not going to act on it, and I'll probably just be celibate. And so what he's going to do is he's going to try to, on the outside, make sure that his life conforms to what the Bible has to say, while on the inside, he actually believes that he's homosexual. That is not what the Bible teaches. It's exactly the opposite of what the Bible teaches. What I need to do is figure out where I am, where I'm supposed to be on the inside, where I'm, where I'm at on the inside. If I'm not where I'm supposed to be on the inside, I want God to change my heart and make me the man that I'm supposed to be so that I can exhibit those things on the outside. And again, that's what this whole chapter is about. And if you've been doing, and we all do this. I just used an extreme example so that you would get it. We all do this. And we think that if I just live a certain way, then somewhere along the line, it's going to purify, purify my heart. And it is not. And that was the point of Romans chapter 2. Follow that? Okay, so I need to have a changed heart. I, you know, I don't drink beer. I don't cuss. I don't beat people up. I don't, you know, you've heard me talk about this. I don't commit adultery. I don't do those things. And it's not because I'm restraining myself. I'm not going through my life going, oh, you know, I, I really want to stop in at that bar right now, but I'm not going to. What I'm going to do is I'm going to live righteously. But on the inside, I'm a drunk. That is not what is happening. I drink as much beer as I want to. I sleep with as many women as I want to. I beat up as many people as I want to. Sometimes that gets on the edge. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just messing around. I beat up as many people as I want to. I rip off as many people as I want to. I just don't want to. I just don't want to. And that's where you want to be, where you just don't want to. And it's not happening by you doing good things. It's going to happen because Jesus does a change, does a work in your heart. Holy living, again, will not produce righteousness, but righteousness will produce holy living. And in verses 6 through 9, you can see um, uh, we're told that we can overcome sin. He says, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more, death no longer has dominion over him. And uh, the passage goes on. And so we can be freed from sin. So when you look at the issue of sin in my life, it's not saying no, no, no to sin. It's actually no, 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 uh, K-N-O-W, about your deliverance from sin. Satan does not want you informed on this. Um, if Satan can, what he wants to do is keep you ignorant, because if he can keep you ignorant, he can keep you impotent. He can keep you without power. You no longer have to be captive to sin. Um, it's not humanly living the divine life that God wants. It's divinely living the human life. And so when I'm not living up to what Jesus has called me to, I ask Jesus to live through me. When I'm not loving the people the way that Jesus calls me to, I ask Jesus to love them through me. And it's a dependence on God the whole time. Joshua was, was told in the Old Testament, Arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I'm giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses, from the wilderness in this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life, as I with, was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. And so when you look at what happened with Joshua, he was brought into the land. The land was already given to him. He was going to have to fight battles, but the land was already given to him. And what he had to do was show up. That's what he had to do. Show up. The people had to go into the land um, and in the same way, you have to go in and possess your possessions. That's all that God was telling Joshua to do. You've got these possessions. I've set you up, buddy. 
All you have to do is go in and possess them. And in this exact same way, I am in a situation where, God, where I can possess the possessions that God has for me, which includes the fact that I can have victory over sin. And so I don't have to li live the way that I've lived before. You know, um, the, the Bible talks about, uh, in this passage, shall we continue in sin? Uh, that, uh, that grace may abound. And he says, certainly not. That word to continue means to abide, to live there, to take up habitual um, persistence in sin. And that is not what I'm supposed to do. I don't live in sin. And if I'm having a problem with sin, there, again, there needs to be a turning away, but it needs to be a dependence upon the Lord, and I need to not be satisfied with where I'm at. You don't take up residence in sin. There's a passage in Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3. You guys, you guys know this, but I'm reading it to you anyway. It says, You he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others." Um, when it says you also once walked according to the course of this world, that word walked in that passage means to walk up and down, to walk about. It's like walking in the mall with your wife. I go walking in the mall with my wife, and I, you know, uh, again, I'm, I'm one of those guys that I just, I, I just want to go to a store, buy the stuff that I need, and turn around and walk out. That's what I want to do. And what she does is meanders. She goes into all, all the different places. And so I can walk into a store with my wife and, you know, maybe I'm looking at something. I look up and she's just gone. And I'm like, where am I? Where's, where'd she go? You know, she's meandering around and she likes to do that. Some people meander in sin. They, they, they walk into it. They meander around. They're comfortable with it. They just stay there. And I am not supposed to be um, living that way. That is the way that you lived before you were a believer. And that is not the way that you're supposed to be living now. A guy named John, uh, Donald Barnhouse said, holiness starts where justification finishes. And if holiness does not start, we have the right to suspect that justification never started either. And this is what that's talking about. When I get saved, I've been justified. But if I'm really justified, then what's going to happen is my life is going to start exhibiting the fact that I have a real walk with Christ, that I'm really in love with him, and it's going to be different. It's going to be different. And so holiness starts as soon as you're justified. If there is no holiness, there's probably no justification either. And so, again, it's something to keep in mind. You, in this passage have baptism as a picture of this new life. Therefore, we were buried with him, verse 4, through baptism into death. In verse 3, do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? And when you go through and look at what baptism is about, it's not about a washing, it's about a funeral, but it's the one funeral you're ever going to go to where everybody's happy because you're dead. Everybody is happy that Steve Winery is dead, that the old Steve Winery is dead. Everybody's happy that the old you is dead too. And the reason that we're happy about that is because you get a brand new life. You get this new life in Christ where there's a new heart and a new spirit and a new attitude. There's something that's absolutely different about you because of what Jesus has done. And so there's, there's joy um, in, in, uh, in this picture because it's the beginning of a new life. Um, verse 6, he says, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. Remember I said it's not t saying no to sin, but knowing what God has done for you. So knowing this, that our old man was crucified. What's that mean? So when Jesus went to the cross, what happened was he got nailed up to it, nailed on the cross. And what he's going to do is he's going to die there. That's what, that's what being crucified means. You saw somebody walking down the street with a cross on their back. They are going to go get nailed on that, and they are going to die. And so you, you see a guy walking down a street carrying a cross. You know the guy's a dead man. He's not dead yet, but he's going to be. And so when Jesus says, I want you to take up your cross and follow me, it's not your mom that's your cross. It's not your children 
that you're a cr that's your cross. It's not your boss. Oh, I got a boss and he's so hard on me, but I guess it's just my cross to bear. That is not what your cross is. A cross is the instrument of your death, and you are going to be good, you are, you are going to be nailed to it. That's what it means to take up your cross. Jesus in Matthew 10, I quote this all the time, but I like it, so I don't care. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves sons or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He who does not take, up, take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. And so I'm supposed to be a guy who's nailed to a cross. Here's the thing about being nailed to a cross, though. You don't die immediately. What happens is you sit there for a while, right? And so Jesus was on the cross for hours. Some people have been on crosses for up to nine days. We have that in the histories. Up to, uh, on a cross for up to nine days. And you know that the whole nine days that they were up there, they were whining and moaning and asking to be taken down, pleading for mercy, that kind of thing. And the Bible talks about the fact that I'm supposed to take myself, my flesh, and I'm supposed to nail it to a cross. And this is where the problem comes in. My flesh doesn't die immediately. It whines and it moans and it asks for mercy. Please let me down. I'll be a good flesh. I won't be a bad flesh anymore. I will control myself. You know, it's, it's okay. You know I, know, I know that I got you in all kinds of problems with the whole drinking thing, but I'll be good. You can have a few little drinks, and I will never come up and, you know, and, and, and jump up and make you a slave again. Just let me down off the cross. Or, you know, I, I know that you had this problem with pornography and stuff like that, but you can get the swimsuit edition of, the, of SI, Sports Illustrated, and stuff like that. I'll, I'll be a good flesh. And, and it's that kind of thing. And you let him down off the cross, and he comes in and takes over your life. And that's what it means to be crucified. I need to take everything that I was, and I need to nail it to a cross. Galatians 2.20 says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life now, that I now live in the flesh, I live through faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So it's not me who's living, it's supposed to be Jesus who's living. I've died, I've been nailed to a cross, and it's Christ who's living through me. And that's what God wants for you. He wants this life, and he wants it to be an abundant one. Um, therefore, it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation, old things have passed away, behold, all things have become new. And that's what baptism is representing. When I get dipped down into the water, it's like I'm, I'm getting buried. I've died. And when I get pulled up out of the water, I've got a brand new life. And what I have to do is figure out which life I'm going to live. Am I going to live the same life that I had before, or am I going to plug myself into the new life that Jesus has for me through the power of the Spirit? And basically, I'm giving you chapter 6, but chapter 7 is all about how it, what happens when a Christian tries to do it on their own. And chapter 8 is the answer to that. You need to do it through the power of the Spirit. And again, it's not me who's living. It's got to be Jesus who's living through me. I get a new heart. I get a new song in my heart. And I get a new nature. And that's what God's given to me as a Christian. Verses 8 through 10 is talking about being freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we also shall live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. And so Jesus died, then he was raised. And the power that I have over sin comes through the resurrection uh, of Jesus. It's not enough for me just to die. I have to die and be resurrected. And again, that's what baptism pictures. Um, we have a new life. We're freed again from spiritual death. Look at nine again. Knowing that Christ having been raised from the dead does, dies no more, death no longer has dominion over him. I am freed from spiritual death. And it's the idea of uh, basically um, my life, you know, if you're dead to something, it has no effect over you. If we've died to sin, there's a transfer of allegiance. If we've died to sin, my allegiance is no longer to sin, but now it's to God. And so I have to know these things. I have to understand it. Because if all I'm doing is try to, trying to deal with sin in the same way that I've always done it, it's never going to work. 
But if I turn away from sin and I turn towards God, if I turn away from, from sin and I keep my eyes on the Lord, ask him to live through me, then all of a sudden things get a whole lot easier as a Christian. You're never going to get to the point where you're temptation proof, but you do come to the point where sin is not as alluring as it used to be. So when I was first coming out of the world, you know, I was talking about bars and partying and, and that kind of stuff. There was a lot more attraction for, for, of that stuff to me than there is now. And I'm, you know, and I'm, I'm not telling you that I'm this super strong spiritual guy right now. I know exactly what I could be if I started messing around with this stuff again. I don't drink. I don't drink anything that has to do with alcohol. I don't drink it because I know what it will do to me. I know what I was. And you know what? I wasn't an alcoholic. And so I don't drink. I don't get near this stuff. But I don't want to either. It's not alluring to me anymore. And I loved beer. Don't need it anymore. I can drink Kool-Aid. Not a problem. I can drink soda pop. Diet. <laughs> not a problem. So you're never going to get, get temptation proof, but it's not going to be as alluring as it was before. When you focus on the Lord and his word, when you begin to know the word, you see sin and the world, world for what it is. You know, my battle with sin is like a dog fight, basically. Um, Cain was told that sin lies at the door and its desire is for, is for you, but you should rule over it. And the way that um, uh, you deal with this whole thing with sin in your life is basically it's which dog you feed the most is which one's going to win. And so if I'm feeding my flesh, then it's going to win. If I'm feeding my spirit, then it's going to win. If I'm reading my Bible, things will be different in my life. If I have a prayer life, if I spend time talking to the Lord, things are going to be different in my life. If I run my life in exactly the same way that I've always run it, then things are going to be exactly the same as they always were. And so it's what you feed. And it becomes this natural thing to read your Bible, to spend some time in prayer, to focus on the Lord. When you get your focus in the right place, then a lot of this stuff just kind of melts away. And it becomes, it becomes this, this awesome thing. Actually, you know what? That's not even a, a really good illustration. It's not necessarily the dog that you feed the most because sin is like weeds. I have never fed my weeds. You know, we're, we're coming up. Uh, you know, I thought I, thought I was going to be mowing my lawn by now. But <laughs> we're coming up on the spring, and what's going to happen is my lawn is going to be full of dandelions. And you know what? I didn't plant them. And every year I go out and I, I spread you know, weed killer out there every single year. And so by the end of the season, most of the weeds are gone and it's looking pretty decent. And then the next spring, everything springs up and dandelions everywhere. I didn't plant them. That is what sin is like in your life. They just spring up. You don't have to feed them. It's just there. What you have to do is you have to actu actually actively feed your lawn. You have to actively fertilize it. You have to actively put some, put some effort into making sure that area of your lawn, weeds versus grass, is getting some support. And it's the same thing spiritually. If you, if you do nothing spiritually, the weeds grow up. If you begin um, walking with the Lord in the, in the sense that he calls you to, read your Bible, spend some time in prayer, just, just focus on Jesus then you're going to have a different life. We're not under the, uh, under the jurisdiction of sin anymore. This passage talks about the fact that sin no longer has a rightful claim over my life as a child of God. Uh, for the Christian to live out the fullness of the new life in Christ, he has to realize what God has done for him. You're not merely a remodeled sinner. You are a remade saint. God didn't do a remodel with you. He killed you and he started over. That's what God does. Then you have the reckoning. And in the next verses, it says, it says verse 11, Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Reckon. I like that word reckon. You want to go down to the corral? Well, I reckon so. Yeah, that's, that's what I think of when I think of reckoning. Um, reckoning is actually um, an act of the mind. It means to take into account to count it as true. And so reckoning, reckoning is not acting as if it is so, it's acting because it, uh, because it is so. You get that? It's not acting as if it's so, it's acting because it's so. 
So there are things I don't have to do anymore because it's so. I don't have to have the same life I had before. I don't have to have the same bondage I had before. I don't have to have the same mouth I had before. I don't have to live the same way that I, that I lived be before because it's so. I don't have to. I have a different life now. God doesn't command us to be dead to sin. He tells us we are dead to sin and alive to God and commands us to act upon it. And so whether we believe it or not, it's still going to be true. It's like basically like God opened up the prison door for you. The door is open. And now you get to make a choice as to whether or not you're going to walk through it. That's what we have. Maybe the problem is that you don't want to. Sometimes that's the problem. You don't want to. So I don't have to live here. I don't have to think this. I don't have to do this. I died to this. That's what I do when, when sin comes up. When, when my attitude starts getting tweaked, I just go, you know what? I don't have to be this guy. I don't have to live like this. I don't have to act like this. I, I, I'm already dead to this. It doesn't have to happen anymore. And so if you're caught up in pornography, you don't have to. You're not caught up. You're going there. You're not addicted. You are going there. You need to act like what the Bible says you are. You're somebody who's been freed from that. And so start, start acting free and turn it off. And again, basically, you know, this stuff has to do with a heart change. Jesus, I want to be like you. Jesus, please change my heart. Jesus, please help me to do the right thing. And then pick your stupid computer up and... and De delete the pages that you've been going to, put a virus program, or not a virus program, you know what I mean. Put a kid protection program on it or whatever. Do whatever needs to be done because you don't have to live there anymore. And just stop living like you're, like you're defeated all the time. I'm alive to God in Jesus. And none of this stuff works without Jesus. We have a place, it's in Christ, and I need to be living there in that place in Jesus. I can think this way, I can do this, I can live there. And then the last thing that he talks about in this passage, well, it's not the last thing, um, but the next thing that he talks about in the passage is yielding, yielding. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves, verse 11, to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present your, yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. That's all about yielding. I don't have to do the things that I was doing any, anymore. The reason that I do them is because I yield my members, uh, it says in the King James Version, as instruments of unrighteousness. The word yield itself um, has the idea of dealing in the area of your will. It's the idea of giving into. It's, and what God wants us to do is no longer give in to sin, but instead present ourselves to him. When, the, uh, when we started this whole thing in our, in our um, city with roundabouts, um, when you would come up to a roundabout, you have a yield sign, right? And so this one time, I was so frustrated, man, when the roundabouts first came in because nobody knew how to use them. And so I, I drove up behind this lady this one time, and if my wife was in the car, she would be yelling at me because I was yelling in the, in the truck. And, and I don't know if the lady saw me. I was kind of above her mirror, but, you know, I was just like, what are you doing? Just because one guy would go by, then there'd be an open space, and she'd just sit there. And another guy would go by, there'd be an open space, and she'd just sit there. Another guy would go by, and after about the third person, usually I get to three, and I'm just like, what is up here? What is going on? My wife would say, she's just an old lady. Be nice to her. She can't hear me. It doesn't matter if I'm nice or not, you know? If, I, if I'm sitting here and I'm, and I'm, I'm getting frustrated, I'm like, I'm like, it says yield, not give up. You get that? It's yield. It's not give up. And so, you know, people will talk about giving up and, and letting go and, 
and that kind of thing. And, and I've known people over the years that have tried that. I just, I'm just going to give up and I'm not going to worry about it anymore. I'm just going to let go and let God. And there's a little bit more to it than that. I am not to yield my members as instruments of unrighteousness. So if I get caught up in an, in an adulterous affair, this is what's happened. I have used my mouth as instruments of unrighteousness because what I have done is flattered some woman to the point where she's interested in me. So I've used my mouth. Before I used my mouth, I started using my eyes. And I yielded them over as instruments of unrighteousness because I was looking at that point. And my eyes were not being used as instruments of righteousness. So first I looked, and then I used my mind as an instrument of unrighteousness, and I thought about all the, all, the, all the things that could happen if I went in a certain direction. And then I opened my mouth, and I start, you know, trying to make her interested in me, and then at some point, the acts themselves take place. And so I have to get in my car, which means I have to walk out to the car, I use my hand to open the car door, I sit my butt on the seat, I turn the car key, and every single time that any of those acts are taking place, I am yielding my hand, I'm yielding my feet, I'm yielding my mind, I'm yielding my mouth, and you can go through the whole act itself, and there is point after point after point where I have yielded myself to, as, as an instrument of unrighteousness, literally parts of my body as instruments of unrighteousness. And instead of doing that, what I'm supposed to be doing is yielding my body as an instrument of righteousness to God, all my members. So my mind needs to be presented as an instrument of righteousness to God. God, I don't want to yield my mind to those thoughts. I want to yield my mind to the things that are of you. My mouth. I'm going to shut my mouth. I'm not going to say things that are going to get me into problems. Instead, of, I'm going to use my mouth as an instrument of righteousness. This is the same thing with, with things like gossip. When you are a gossip, you are yielding your tongue as an instrument of unrighteousness. And instead of yielding your tongue as an instrument of unrighteousness, then what you, what you should be doing is using your tongue as something that spreads righteousness instead of spreading deceit and evil and wickedness. Right? And that starts in the mind, too, because you started in your head. And so you, you had an attitude towards some person. You had an attitude towards the things that they were doing. You have an attitude, and the attitude is an ungodly one. And what you do is you change your mind. You go, you know what? That's not where my head's going with this person. I'm not going to do this. In fact, you know, I don't like them because, you know, they're doing thus and such or they're, you know, they, they're, they're doing better than me and that kind of stuff. And I'm going to start praying about that. Instead of um, actively opposing them with my stupid tongue, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start praying for them and asking God to help me to love them. And I'm going to actually rejoice in the things that they're rejoicing in and weeping over the things that they're weeping over. I'm going to have that kind of attitude in my head. And that's going to be exhibited through your tongue later on. And again, it's just yielding your members. And so when, when you talk about whatever sin you're in, think about the sin that you're in, because some of you are thinking about it right now. Think about the sin that you're in. And in every act that your body does, it's an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to speak to you and to convict you of your sin. Don't open that door, Steve. Don't walk out. Don't go to the car, Steve. See what I mean? Don't turn the key. And at every single step is an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to be speaking to your heart. And I would just submit to you that he has been, and you've been ignoring it. And that's why you get in the places that you're in. You yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness. Isn't that cool? Because the same thing that gets me into, the, into my problems is exactly the same thing that's going to get me out. I don't, have to go, I don't have to go this direction anymore. Now I can go this direction. And as soon as I get tempted to go this direction, I know exactly what I need to do, do in this direction. My mind goes here, and I know exactly where my mind's supposed to be, and it needs to go here. And I go, I'm not going here. Instead, what I'm going to do, Lord, is I'm going to yield myself to you in this arena. Will you please change me? Will you please make me? So on. I will not let sin rule. It says, uh, again, it says in the passage, therefore, verse 12, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. I have a choice in the matter. I am not just the sum of my DNA. I'm not just the sum of my upbringing. I can pick it 
and I will not, is the idea behind that, right? So I'm not going to present my members. Present means to stand beside, to place at disposal. And so I don't present my, my members as an instrument of unrighteousness. I don't place it at the disposal of the enemy, right? Paul, in Romans 12, 1 through, 2, uh, 1 through 2, you guys know the verse said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So not only is my spirit presented to God, it's my body that's presented to, to God, too. Um, Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 5. This is 5, 14 through 15 in the, in the King James. I like it in the King James. It says, for the love of God, of, of Christ constrains us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we were all dead and that he died for all, that, we, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but to him uh, which died for them and rose again. And so Jesus died for all. That means I was dead. And so now the life that I live is not a life that I'm supposed to be living for me anymore. It's a life that I'm supposed to be living for him. You were bought with a price, Paul says. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You know, um, one of the things that, that, again, you need to understand about this whole thing is that all sin, all acts of sin, come as an act of presentation. Again, I'm presenting my members as their instruments of unrighteousness. It comes as an act of presentation, um, and I'm placing my body, my mind, my eyes, my hands, my feet um, at, um, at the disposal of sin. It's, I'm, I'm actively doing that when I'm in sin. And so you have Job who said this, I made a covenant with my eyes, not to look on, uh, to look with lust at a young woman. So there has to be a covenant, basically, that's placed in your heart. And so this is something that, you know, I don't know if, about girls, but I'm speaking of this, at this from a guy's point of view. This is something that guys deal with. You know what? The first look is never sin, not necessarily. It's not sin to, to notice a cute girl. It is sin as you're driving down the road and you notice the cute girl on the side of the road to adjust your mirror so that you can look at her. That's where the sin comes in. It's not the first, the first look that gets you in the problem, into the problem. It's the second look that gets you into the problem. And so what you do is you make a covenant. And I, I, I do this. If I see a cute girl, I'm, I'm as attracted to, to girls as anybody else. If I see a cute girl on the side of the road, what immediately happens, my wife has watched me on this too. I know she, she's looking at me. What immediately happens is I take my eyes off the mirror and I just look straight ahead. And I just go on. You go, well, that's okay, Steve, that's... That's good information. It's the second look that gets me into problems. And so I'll just make the first look a really long one. <laughs> and what you did there was you presented your mind as an instrument of unrighteousness. <laughs> of course, I put it in your mind, so. <laughs> you know, when you go through the Bible, think of, think of those who've uh, uh, presented their lives as instruments of righteousness to God what, and what God did with them. So David, with a sling and a stone, defeated a giant, right? And God spoke through the mouths of Elijah and Elisha and Isaiah, and Jeremiah, all the prophets. And Paul's feet took him from city to city, literally changing people's lives. John's eyes, we're doing this on on Sunday nights, saw visions of the future of God's plan for the universe. His ears heard God's message and his fingers wrote it down in a book that's been read and reread for 2,000 years. Then on the other hand, you have, a, have the situations where people presented their members for sinful purposes. David's eyes looked upon another man's wife. His mind plotted a filthy scheme. His hand signed a cowardly order that caused Bathsheba's husband to be killed. And it was all his choice in the matter. Um, one of the things that we always need to remember about sin is that it always comes out, always comes out. You're never going to be able to hide from it. 
Uh, Moses said this in Numbers 23, or 32, 23, says, but if you do not do so, then take note, you've sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. Satan will put you in a position where he thinks, where, where he makes you think that nobody's ever going to know about your stuff. And then he tells it. And then he goes, everybody knows. And a lot of times they don't all know, because not everybody's interested in you. In, in either case, what Satan's doing is manipulating you. You need to know that your sin is going to find you out, and it needs to be something that turns you away from that. Um, let me read you Romans 6.13 um, out of Weist, and then I'll let you go. I just looked at the clock. Sorry, you guys. Um, this, is, this is out of uh, Weist's expanded New Testament. He said this. So verse 13, it says, Do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness as sin, but present your, yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and so on. This is what we says about this. Thus also, as for you, you be constantly counting upon the fact that on the one hand, you are those who have been separated from the sinful nature, and on the other, that you are living ones with respect to God in Christ Jesus. Stop therefore allowing the sinful nature to reign as king in your mortal body with a view to obeying it in its passionate cravings. Moreover, stop putting your members at the disposal of the sinful nature as weapons of unrighteousness, but by a once for all uh, act and at once, put yourselves at the disposal of God as those who are actively alive out from among the dead and put your members as weapons of righteousness at the disposal of God. For then the sinful nature will not exercise lordship over you, for you are not under law, but under grace." And last thing I want to say to you is look at verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. That's attitude. And you need to have an attitude. This is my house. This is something that we used to do when, when I played sports. When, I, when we were in college, uh, when I was in high school, um, you came over to our school. You're in our house now. This is my house. And things get done my way in my house and I don't have to live this way anymore. Um, when, 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 you know, everything's a sports analogy to me. In, in football, it was the first hit. You're in my house. And I don't care if I'm, a, if I'm at your school, but this place right here, I got about a five by five area. This is my house. I'm gonna smack you down. And it's attitude. It's the same thing with wrestling. I used to wrestle, sit across from that from the, from the other guy, and you had those guys who would wrestle, and they're looking at the other guy, and he's so, he's so big, and he's way more muscular than me. No, 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 you know, that stuff. And that's not the attitude that you need to have. You need to look at him, and you need to lock eyes with the guy, and you're like, this is my house, and I'm about to rub your face in the mat. And that's the attitude that you have to have. Taekwondo, I'm going to kick you through the wall, punk. <laughs> That kind of thing. And it's, a, it's the same kind of attitude that, that we're supposed to have in this whole thing. Sin shall not have dominion over you. Amen. It shall not. And I don't, I, again, I don't have to. Okay, so that's this passage right here. That's this passage. When you get to chapter 7, it's all about going back and trying to do it by the rules. Okay? The, the rules are, Jesus has already done this for me. I just need to plug into it. But what people do is they go back to the rules in the sense of, oh, I'm not supposed to be doing that, so I'm going to try hard not to do it. And chapter 7 is all about people trying hard and losing. And then chapter 8 is all about doing it in the power of the Spirit. So everything that I've just said to you, you can take and you can write it down, you can make it a set of rules, right? And it, it you know, they, they are, it, it is a rule. It is, you know, they are guidelines. But you can make it a set of rules, you can stack it, tack it up on your fridge, and you can say, I'm going to do this from now on, and that kind of thing. And there's no dependence upon Christ, there's no dependence upon the Holy Spirit, and you can be for sure that you are never going to get it done, because you're never doing this without Jesus. And that's what chapter 8 is about. So chapter 7 is about trying to do it on your own. Chapter 8 is about you need to do it in the power of the Spirit. So, I reckon myself to be dead to sin in chapter 6. I recognize I can't do it on my own in chapter 7, and I realize in chapter 8 that I need the power of the Holy Spirit in my life to get these things done. But I don't have to lose, and neither do you. Right? Afterwards, uh, we're going to have some of the elders up front here, some of the ladies too, um, to pray for you if, if you need some prayer in these issues, and I'd uh, love to have you take advantage of that. Let's all stand. Let's get out of here. <clears throat> 
And God, again, we thank you for the, the power of your spirit, Lord. We thank you for the changed life that you give us. We thank you for the, the fact that we're not in this on our own. Uh, we have you, Lord Jesus. Um, Lord, we pray that you would help us to get our mindset right. Um, and again, like the passage says, we need to be presenting our bodies as instruments of righteousness. All our members, Lord, they need to be some doing things that are glorifying to you. And God, as we said, as a once for all act and at once, Lord, we want to make these things true in our lives. And so, uh, Lord, we just pray that you'd help us, um, help us to have the holiness and the righteousness that you've called us to. And Lord, that there would be a purity about it, not a fake, phony churchiness about it, but there would be a real purity about the lives that we have for you. So, God, I commend these people into your hands. Pray that you'd bless them and that you fill them with your spirit. Make these things true. And we ask this in all in Jesus' name. Amen.